Magandang araw muli sa ating lahat. Ako po si Professor Shirley Guevara, dekana ng Koleyo ng Ekonomiyang Pantahanan. Ako ay isang food technologist na ngayon ay nagtuturo ng mga kurso upol sa food service and hotel management sa ilalim ng Department of Hotel, Restaurant and Institution Management. Ang aming koleyo ay nakatuon sa pang-araw-araw na pangangailangan ng pamilyang Pilipino tulad ng pagkain, pananamit, tirahan at pakikitungo sa loob ng pamilya. Ang kurso ng FN1 na pinamagatang Food Trip ay isang general education course na ibinibigay ng Department of Food Science and Nutrition ng aming koleyo. Dito tinatalakay ang iba't ibang aspeto ng pagkain sa pang-araw-araw na buhay ng tao at lipunan. Pinag-uusapan rito ang social, cultural, economic, political, at psychological na mga aspeto ng pagkain at mga praktikal na pamamaraan upang masiguro at mapabuti ang kalusugan at nutrisyon ng ating sarili at ng ating pamilya. Kasama ko dito ngayon ang mga guro ng kursong ito. Magandang araw sa ating lahat. Ako naman si Dr. Blanca Villarino, isang food technologist na nagtuturo ng mga kurso ukol sa statistics in food research, research methods, at sensory evaluation. Magandang umaga sa ating lahat. Ako naman si Professor Aaron Bonifacio, isang registered nutritionist dietitian na nagtuturo ng mga kurso ukol sa public health nutrition. Ako rin ang college information officer ng aming kolehiyo. So bali ngayon, ating ipagpapatuloy ang ating segment na pinamagatang Kainsaysayan. Sa nakaraang episode, atin naumpisahan ang segment na ito sa paraan ng pamamuhay at pagkain ng ating mga ninuno during the pre-colonial period. So sa episode naman na ito, ating ipagpapatuloy ang talakayan sa evolusyon ng Philippine cuisine mula sa pagdating ng mga Kastila o ang Spanish occupation. Naritong muli ang kagalang-galang na panauhin natin na si Ginang Feliz Prudente Santa Maria. Siya ay isang food historian, cultural worker, and culinary heritage advocate for 50 years. She pioneers Philippine food history and specializes in the Spanish and American colonial eras. She's the author of several award-winning books, including The Governor General's Kitchen, Culinary Vignettes and Period Recipes, 1521 to 1935, The Foods of Serizal, and the recently released Piga Feta's Philippine Picnic Book. Kamusta po kayo ngayong araw, Ma'am Feliz? Ay, salamat. Enjoy ako dito sa inyo. I love to share my research. Naku, maraming so, salamat. Excited <laughs> din po kami. Pag-uusapan ulit ano, ang uh, mga bagay-bagay regarding... Uh, ang ating mga food waste, no? Yes. At uh, siguro, didiretso na ulit tayo sa ating unang tanong. Magandang araw po muli, uh, Ma'am Feliz. So yung mga Kastila po, nung dumating sila dito sa Pilipinas, considered po silang minority. Pero matagumpay po nilang naikalat ang kanilang mga paniniwala at kultura sa mga Pilipino. Paano po kaya nila nagawa ito? <laughs> Tama yan. Talagang minority sila. You know, um, malayo kasi tayo sa Espanya. So, noon, ang um, pagpunta dito until only 1815, no? So, mula 1565, when the colonialization began, up to 1815, the only way to come to the Philippines that they were using was you go across the Atlantic Ocean. You wait in Mexico. Tapos pag maganda na yung panahon, the winds are, are uh, blowing towards the west. You ride na naman a galleon, and then you come to the Philippines. So it would take sometimes a year to two years. That is a one journey, one journey, one way journey one year to two years to get from Spain to the Philippines. Minsan, pagdating nila sa Mexico, walang dumarating na galyon galing Pilipinas. So, hihintay sila. Minsan, apat na taon yan. Hihintay sila sa Mexico. Isipin ninyo po yan. Tapos, bakit hindi dumarating yung barko? Masamang panahon. 
may mga pirata, they uh, crashed and sank. So, ipat maraming ayaw from during the Galleon period from 1565 to 1815. Maraming may ayaw na Kastila na pumunta dito sa atin. Madali ka mamatay dyan sa Galleon, sa Galleon uh, voyage. At saka, hirap na hirap sila talaga. You know, the Galleon before had no individual rooms. The, the food was terrible. It, was, it consisted of, of dried meats and dried fish. And, I mean, it, it, it was really so terrible. So, ayaw talagang pumunta dito yung mga Spanish. So, uh, at the end of the Spanish colonial period, after 333 years of Spanish um, colonialization, there were only, here, I have my notes, okay? In 1898, you know, acting um, Philippine Revolution, no? There were only 34,000 Spaniards at the time versus over 6 million Filipinos. So isipin po ninyo, 38,000 Spaniards all over the whole country. Pero balikan po natin, no? The start of that colonial period. Uh, kung spakain po, I divide the Spanish period into three. The first part is the first 150 years of those 333 years. Yun muna yung uh, medyo ikikwento ko po. Yung first 150 years. Di ba sinabi po natin na during the pre-colonial period, our Filipinos ancestors ate for physical survival. And it was important for them that they were in the good graces of their gods. No? Because they were aware that the gods, that's how they looked at it, the gods were the ones that provided a good natural environment, good weather uh, for them to be able to feed themselves. So, paano po umibayan? The entire Spanish era, so we have now in the first 150 years, we are learning to become Roman Catholics. And we are following the rules of Roman Catholic eating, which includes fasting, abstinence, and feasting. And the friars provided a calendar, a global calendar, of when to feast, when to fast, and when to abstain. We were taught the Spanish way of doing all those three, which included, among other things, eating lechon as part of our feast. Now remember, before the Spanish settled in the Philippines, we used pork as a ritual animal. So it was not difficult for the Spanish missionaries to say, at the end of a Christian uh, novenario and the celebration of a fiesta, we will eat pork. Of course, why were we eating pork? For the Spanish, they were eating pork because they had to deal with a Jewish and a Muslim uh, community in Spain. And as the Muslims slowly were uh, expelled from Spain, and as the Jews were expelled from Spain, you proved your Christianity by eating pig. So that was part of our lechon story. Now, very interesting is that the, the missionaries talked about Christ's food, okay? The food of Christ. And what they meant by the food of Christ was they encouraged the natives to share food with others. That was caridad. 
that was showing charity to other people. Now this picks up from our wanting to make sure nobody goes hungry. There is a word that comes out of the Spanish research, not out of the, uh, the Spanish period research, not out of the pre-colonial research. And the word that I would love for all of you to remember is nayanaya. Nayanaya is a Cebuano word. It was used all the way into Bohol as well as Northern Mindanao. So nayanaya was recorded in 1851, but clearly, clearly it seems to be a pre-colonial sentiment. Nayanaya means firstly, to entertain other people, to feed other people. And by doing that, you reach the second meaning, which is to become a happy person. So in other words, Filipinos like to feed other people just as much as Filipinos like eating. That is part of our culinary heritage. Ma'am no, Felice, I'm sorry, sorry to interject po, no? Kasi we're talking about linguistics na rin, ano? Um, yung chocolate A and chocolate A, can you talk about it? Because that, uh, those words are also uh, connected with uh, the friars, no? Um, you know, that ano, is, the, the chocolate nun? A, okay. The chocolate A, aguada, meaning thin, and the chocolate e from espejo meaning thick, okay? You know what's very strange about that? Mm -hmm. For all we know, it was an invention of Jose Rizal. Oh. I'm okay. serious. It could be. I mean, the term chocolate, uh, remember the friar would say, oh, give us chocolate e, meaning he had a, a very important guest and he wanted the chocolate to be thick. Or he would say, uh, give me chocolate, Ay, the aguada, no? the watery, because this person isn't so important, you know? Um, the, only, <laughs> the only time we find that used is in Rizal's novel. Oh. So it may have been, I'm not saying that it is, but the fact mm -hmm. that I don't see it come out in other literature of the era, the fact that I don't see it come out in any of the, uh, the Spanish records that I, 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 I've come across. I'm just wondering, you know, you never know. Rizal was a brilliant writer. So or it that, could have that, been, ma'am, so, ma Feliz, it could have been a, an, um, an observation also of uh, the Filipinos who worked under the friars, di ba? Parang pag may bisita, lumalabas yun sa, sa bibig nila yun, ano? And, uh, you know, pinick up ni, ni Jose Rizal as yes. part of uh, you know, his... Uh, it's very possible. It's, it's very <laughs> possible that he heard it with one priest. It's very possible that several priests also used the same cue to their cook. But it also could have really just been an imagination. The imagination. Mm -hmm. But definitely, if we go into, okay, we're moving, sort of moving out of the, uh, moving, <laughs> moving out of the uh, spirituality of food, but mm -hmm. uh, chocolate was indeed introduced during the Spanish era. Cacao is native to Mexico. And when the Spanish found chocolate, the friars picked it up right away because it's a stimulant. In fact, Chocolate is, I believe, the first caffeine in the Filipino diet. Yes, Apple. Yeah. And that did not come in. Um, that did not come in until um, around the 1700s, the late, the late, very late 1600s, when the first cacao sapling was brought into the Philippines for planting. And there's a whole story about that, but. The point is that yes, you could make chocolate beverage uh, thick and you could make it thin, 
For the Spanish, they liked it so thick that they would even thicken it with breadcrumbs. And the idea was that you could get a spoon. The saying was, you can get a little spoon and put it in a cup of chocolate and the spoon will stand up on its own. The, the whole cacao culture included what they called sopas. Not soup, okay? Not sopa, but, which means soup, but sopas. The sopas um, is a piece of bread that you can put into your thick chocolate, swirl it around, and therefore take up the last bits of thick chocolate. It's like a sponge, and then you eat it. And the natives, what they used when there was no uh, bread, for instance, we nativized the sopas. We used a uh, boiled banana, or we used boiled sweet potato. So those were two native sopases that we invented. Si Ma'am Feliz, maganda po yung ano na we have discussed na something na as concept of chocolate and chocolate. Uh, and totoo nga po galing nga sa mga Spanish colonizers po natin yun. Pero mabalik ko lang po, no? ang ganda po kasi nasi-share nyo about uh, Naya Naya and Saya Saya. Can you continue yun, the story of that uh, in our culture or history? Well, Naya Naya, as I was saying, uh, is a Cebuano word that was recorded in the 1850s, but that is clearly a pre, seems to be clearly a pre-colonial sentiment. So Filipinos like to uh, serve food, Filipinos like to feed as much as Filipinos like to eat. So when the friars were trying to teach Filipinos to become Roman Catholics, and they were trying to get Filipinos to serve Christ's food, to be charitable, it was quite easy. And they noticed that, you know, there were many friars. They said, you know, the Filipinos, they're very charitable. They, they, when it's time to give food to the poor, they always do that. When it's time to give food to the hardworking people who make the, the gunpowder, which was one of the worst jobs to do, they, they want to do that. They want to feed. So it could be that in our nature, in our, in our DNA, Filipinos are very charitable when it comes to feeding. And finding that out to me is very important because it shows that food history is telling something very noble about who the Filipino is. And look at it even now. We have community pantries. Before that, we had cooked yes. food. I mean, I remember even here in my village, everybody was funding someone who was cooking food and sending it out. So we, we have this sentiment during EDSA power in 1986, people were bringing food. I remember in the middle of the morning, I was bringing coffee, lots of coffee to one section of people who were there trying to defend us from the tanks if the tanks came up the mountain or the hillside. So this is important for us to continue the sense of naya naya, the wanting to feed others and not just feed ourselves. Uh, naya naya creates naya naya on. And naya naya on means that as a person, the person now becomes happy, the person becomes content, the person is spiritually balanced from having fed other people and now can be benign, can now be at peace with the world. So again, we find Ganda. another use for food by studying the vocabulary. And what else did the, uh, did the Catholic priests do? We had our gods for harvest, our gods for weather. We had our gods for um, many, many um, 
functions of food and uh, important to the growing of food. Well, what they did was they taught us that there was San Isidro, the patron of farmers. There was Santa Marta, the patron of cooks. There was um, San Nicolas de Tolentino, patron of bakers. So you can see how they could shift from the pagan easily into the Roman Catholicism of the Renaissance era. There was also one very important uh, contribution that the Spanish made to Philippine cuisine at that time, and it was the introduction of wheat. We were not growing wheat. We grew millet, we grew rice, we grew sorghum, panicum. So we had four grain, but we were not growing uh, wheat. And they tried to grow wheat. And at some point we had enough wheat that people were profiting because they grew the wheat that needed to be baked. But going back to the religious aspect of it, the friars had a problem. How were they going to explain Christ as the bread of life? How were they going to explain the miracle yeah. of the loaves and the fish to people who didn't know what wheat was, who didn't know what bread was? So they went back to the word list of 1521, the pre-colonial word list made by Pigafetta. And Pigafetta had the word tinapay. It was the very first to record the word tinapay. And he said tinapay was a certain kind of rice cake. He didn't describe what it was. But we know that if you make tapay, if you make a dough, you end up with tinapay. So maybe it was generic. We have no idea. But the friars took the word tinapay and they used tinapay to mean host, to mean the bread of life, and to mean the loaves that came with the fish. Now, in the 1800s, we find a description of tinapay, but this is many centuries later. And uh, Father Encarnacion says that tinapay was two, two circles, two circles of uh, a rice, a rice, uh, rice pancake, like pancake. And you put something sweet in the middle and then you put the other pancake on top and you fold it in half. So it may be that was what it was during Pigafetta's time. We have no idea. But the fact that the tinapay of Encarnacion starts with a circle, it's very much like the host that was used, that is used during mass. So thankfully, uh, because of Pigafetta's definition, we now know that our wheat bread, the loaves with the loaves and the fish, okay, the wheat bread once meant a rice cake. So you can see through food history how changes occur in the meanings of words. So that is, that is another story out of the missionary work. Yan, Ma'am Feliz. So, aside from the uh, spiritual or religious aspect ng, ng influence po ng mga Spaniards sa ating uh, cuisine, ano po ba yung mga trade at socio-political relations sa mga Filipino noong mga panahong yun na tumulong din pong magdala ng iba't ibang Western influences sa ating lokal na kultru kultura at pagkain? Pwede niyo po ba kami bigyan ng mga example? Yes. So, after the 150 years when only the missionaries were allowed to live with the folk, we begin a second period, an interim period, um, where now the regular Spanish lay could mix with the Filipinos. They could live with the Filipinos. And so this is the first time that now we are getting a sense, the, the natives are getting a sense 
of not just being Spanish Catholic, but being Spanish. What is secular Spanish food? The closest they got to that during the, um, during the uh, earlier 150 years was during the feasting food. So this is where the Spanish friars could teach them the home cooking that they knew. Now, aside from the um, Catholicism going into the culinary culture, we need to remember that politics um, created the sense of food as tribute. The start of, this, the, start of the uh, Spanish era was very difficult for natives who were living around the area of Manila because the Spanish were forced by law to live only in Manila and a few of the forts, about seven or eight forts, that's all. So it was really the missionaries going out. So you can see that the uh, ability to accept Spanish culture was the ability to accept Catholicism in the beginning. So now when we have uh, the areas where the Spanish were concentrated, that is where they started to mix with the natives, Manila being uh, the headquarters. The problem was the Spanish were not growing food. They could not really grow enough food to feed themselves inside the city of Manila. So they would store food, they would stockpile food, and the areas around Manila had to supply them with food. And it became obligatory. It was like, whether you like it or not, you have to give us the food quota that we specified. So that became a bit of a hardship for the Filipinos. In addition, uh, later, the priests uh, in the late 1500s, they started what they called the reducción. In other words, Filipino communities followed river, the riverbanks, or they followed the shoreline of the beaches. And what the priests wanted to do was bring these different communities together closer to each other. They would reduce the space. Uh, they would bring the people to live together in a parish. The parish is the one we know of today with the central plaza, the church on one side, and then the government office on the other, uh, the market somewhere there, and then the leadership, the principalia also in houses close to the plaza. Why do I, why do I bring this up? Because that was when Filipinos started to have individual lots. The houses now had yards, gardens, if you want to call it that. And in addition to the individual residential lots, a parish also had, most of the time, a communal area. And that communal area would be farmed for the benefit of everybody in the community. It was also grazing land, pasture land. Again, for the benefit of the entire community. So this is when uh, Spanish law required each household to plant certain vegetables, you know, like a coconut tree, for instance, uh, abaca, for that matter, because that was part of the tribute. You could give abaca as part of the tribute. Uh, they wanted each family to raise a certain number of chickens, a certain number of pigs, not only for them to eat, but because pigs and chickens were part of the tribute. They were given to help feed the Spanish who were supposed to provide the military presence to protect these communities. So that, that, that's how the system worked, okay? Aside from that, change in our culture where now every home had a lot okay everyone had a lot 
there was also the idea of food as a business. And part of the business was providing provisions for the galleon trade. And this meant salted meat, salted fish, additional rice, um, preserved, uh, preserved fruits, for instance. Now, if you were lucky enough to get a government contract, then you could earn from this not only food that you were growing, additional food beyond the tribute, but also food processing. And the ones, however, who really earned from it were the Chinese overseas workers that had been brought in. Because this, the, natives were, the natives were under the care of the missionaries. But now the profit center of Spain, the trade, required additional services that the natives did not really know about. Whereas the Chinese had come from a long culture of meat preserving and in bulk. So they came in and they were the ones who started earning quite a lot of money by providing these um, government contracts, you know, filling these government contracts. And they started, they were allowed to marry native women if they, the overseas Chinese, converted to Catholicism. So we now have a situation where we have so many Chinese coming in to earn, I mean, sincerely, to earn. They were providing restaurants for the Spanish inside the Parian. They were baking bread for the Spanish inside the Parian. They were serving as cooks to some of the families of Intramuros. And they were providing the salt, tons and tons of salt that um, were needed for preserving the food that would be carried on the galleon and that would be carried by the military on their various, um, their various missions. Now, once you start marrying the Christian Chinese with the Christian native, what do you get? You get the mestizo. And within the first 150 years, before we get into the secularization of Philippine cuisine, there are so many mestizos, Chinese mestizos, that a tribute category and a tax category has to be created for all these mestizos. See, the, the population shift and the wealth shift was now a product of the political and economic requirements that the Spanish brought. So, uh, Ma'am Feliz, uh, nasabi niyo po kanina na katulad nga po ng mga dinilang pagkain ng mga uh, Kastila, yung cacao, no, yung konsepto ng pagkakaroon ng tinapay, no, uh, na nadala din naman natin po no, sa panahon ngayon. Ano pa po yung mga halimbawa na ingredients, food preparation techniques, or even food beliefs na nakuha po natin uh, from the Spaniards? Well, importante, malaman natin na meron din tayong mga kinakain ngayon na galing talaga sa panahon na yan, no? Uh, for instance, uh, the studies have shown that there were more than 230 botanicals uh, that came from the Americas into the Philippines during the galleon trade, which ended, by the way, in 1815. No? Uh, this period of the galleon trade also saw the Philippines sending uh, foods to the New World. And coconut was one of the things that we sent to the New World and our making of tuba also has become acknowledged as part of Mexican culinary heritage credited to Filipino seamen who stayed in Mexico. They didn't want to take the galleon back to the Philippines after the horrendous, horrifying trip that they had experienced going from Manila to Acapulco. Now, the, among the many uh, 
among the many botanicals that were introduced from the West would, not, would be not only the cacao and the wheat, but things that we eat every day like papaya, pineapple, those things came from uh, abroad, no? from the West. The atis, for instance, was considered the most beautiful and most delicious fruit growing in the Philippines. And that was again credited to the, the missionaries who were the ones really trying to uh, invest in agriculture. The Spaniards did not want to farm. They wanted to stay with the galleon trade and sit back and wait for the returns to come in. They did not see farming as a respectable career for themselves. And there are many records that say that. So it is to the friars that we owe a lot for the initial agricultural, um, the agricultural technology. They were the ones who brought in some of the sugar mills, the very first sugar mills, for instance, and taught us how to produce the sugar that eventually would be exported. So the, this whole political situation, agricultural situation comes together with some of the, um, some of the, new, the new techniques that are brought in, the agricultural techniques. The, among the other foods that we, we eat every day that came from the new world would be corn, peanut, for instance, uh, the chili pepper, the avocado, See, to us, these are Filipino foods, but they came from somewhere else. Now, during the Spanish period, it's important to also know that we did not just get seeds and saplings from the New World. The Chinese were also bringing in things like lychee. They were already growing in, um, in the Zambales area. And then we had uh, seeds that came from Japan, we had seeds that came from Java. You know, the, we, we have to feel this sense of internationalism that comes into the food even then. Because there is nothing wrong with this internationalism of ingredients that makes the possibilities of the skill in cooking grow and enhance. The uh, Spanish period, for instance, introduced us to guisado, stew making. And, you know, we think of guisado as stir frying, but that's actually only the first step of a full guisado. You take the, um, the fragrant and flavoring ingredients and you, you uh, quickly fry them in oil, and then you add... Um, you add the protein, you should be the meat, and you allow the juices of the meat to come out and they soften. And then you add the liquid and you allow that whole thing to cook slowly until you get the thickening that is done by the combination of ingredients and a enrichment of the savoriness or the umami. So the guisado was definitely not here. There are historical documents that prove that. So I think we should be thankful that we, we had the guisado introduced because look now, there's so many Filipino guisados using not only the foreign ingredients, but the Asian ingredients. Filipino food has an Asian spine. That spine will, is something we will never be rid of and we need to strengthen the availability of the ingredients of that Asian spine, because that is what will help nativize the different, food, different kinds of foods that we are exposed to. The other Anthony, thing that... Uh, can you uh, no, elaborate on the concept of guisado? Okay. Guisado, if you look at what guisado really means, guisado has three steps to the making of a stew. The first step is the stir frying, if you want to call it that, no? It's the light frying, the sofrito, usually here of tomato, onion, and garlic. And remember, the tomato and the white onion were not yet here. Those were brought in by the Spanish. So after you 
make this sofrito, then you add your principal meat protein, which could be pork, which could be chicken, and which could be beef. The beef, by the way, the cow was introduced during the Spanish period. And there was a ranching program to uh, increase the number of European type cows. At the same time, there was also a mandate that the wild carabao be tamed. And so carab beef came into the picture. It was the Spanish era that introduced dairy, the idea of dairy from both the cow and the carabao. And what happened was the carabao milk was found to be more acceptable even to the Spanish who were living here. So carabao milk became very much part of our culture. And it's sad that uh, carabao milk is something that needs to keep getting revived and revived and revived as the carabao suffer from all sorts of illnesses. But um, aside from the dairy culture, the eating of beef, the making of the guisado, the slow cooking, that is actually the slow cooking the, that comes up with a sauce. You end up with a sauce in your stew. Okay? So we have the, the um, guisado, eating beef. Then we have the dairy culture. We also have marinating, getting a protein or a vegetable and putting it into a marinade, allowing the chemistry of the marinade to help soften, make it easier to digest the protein, okay? So after you marinate, let's say the meat for a long time, then you remove it from the marinade and you can either roast it or if you want, you can cook it in the marinade and allow the meat again to soften and it becomes a stew again or a braised dish, okay? So all of this comes from the Spanish. Now, the, word, the Spanish word for marinade, what you steep your protein in is adobo. The marinade is called adobo. And when the priests were trying to find a synonym for adobo, because you see adobo, the meats that are marinated in vinegar and then cooked last longer than if they're just fried, if they're not marinated. So it was very important for the friars to find the local word for adobo. The thing was, there was no word. The closest that they found was kilau. Kilau, you would get vinegar or a souring agent, and you would get the raw fish or the raw uh, seafood or the vegetables, and you would pass them quickly in that vinegar bath and eat it uncooked. So the friars explained that you cannot use the term kilau to mean adobo because the kilau is never cooked. Whereas our Spanish adobo is cooked. But you can see that it was very easy to introduce the adobado into the Philippines because we already had a culture of making kilau. It just meant that now you've got to steep the protein instead of taking it out quickly and eating it raw, okay? They also taught us to fry with pork lard. And it was because of the Chinese also that um, we were frying with pork lard. We were frying so much that in the 1500s, shortly after um, Manila was founded, we were already starting to import 
pork lard in bulk from China. And this would eventually be, become a challenge during the American colonial period, as I will later explain. Something else that was introduced during the Spanish period was the ensalada, the salad. And again, the priests were saying, well, is there a, a native word for ensalada? And the closest they could find was kilau. Again, kilau. Because they found that Filipinos were taking greens, were taking herbs, and were putting them in the vinegar. But the kilau was not an ensalada because kilau had no olive oil. So you can see how it was easy for Filipino food to somehow take on certain Spanish dishes because all you have to do is take the kilau, allow the greens like the pako to stay there a little longer and add, add some oil. So the, these again are uh, some of the influences from Spain. Parang ano mga Feliz, hindi naman masyado rin nagbago, no? Parang kung paano rin natin pa rin kainin ang pako o ang, uh, di ba, yung cucumber na lalagay ng konting uh, suka, uh, asin at paminta. Hindi naman tayo, I think, naglalagay na ng oil pa rin. So nakuha pa rin natin kung ano yung dati, hindi siya masyado nagbago. Yes, si ang nangyari, yung cucumber na galing sa abroad, ginamit natin using a Filipino cooking method. You know, we, we, we need to understand that we decide what we want to accept from abroad. It's not as if foreign food is forced down our throats. The only food customs that were forced were those that related to the Catholic Church. Everything else was by choice. It's up yeah. to us, you see. Do we want to make guisado? Do we want to make adobo? Do we want to add adobo to kilau? They also yeah, mentioned agree. that hmm? they also mentioned that escabeche. They were trying to find, do the Filipinos have escabeche? What was the closest? Kilau again. You see? Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that we nativize what they, what we're exposed to. And we're still doing it now. I mean, look at pizza. We have Filipino pizza. We have Filipino spaghetti. It's the same thing. We have Filipino guisado. We have Filipino ensalada. Yeah. Ang Filis, nabanggit niyo na yung mga Western food like uh, pizza, no? Pwede ho bang pumunta tayo sa uh, panghuling question? Ano po? Uh, yung significance ng celebration ng 1898 Malolos Convention? Dahil po ibang klase naman ng pagkain ang inihanda dito no? na as part of the inauguration of the First Philippine Republic. Pwede ho ba ninyong uh, uh, bigyang uh, linaw po ito sa amin? Well, the last phase of uh, Spanish cooking in the Philippines is what I, it, it happens after there is no more galleon trade. Whereas before, the Filipino cooking was highly influenced by the empire itself. So that includes the New World. What happens is there's no more galleon trade. So we don't have this direct connection anymore to the New World. Instead, we now become focused on the peninsula. We finally become focused on España and the cooking in Spain after only after 1815. And one more thing we need to remember that it was again very difficult to come to the Philippines. So again, only few Spanish were coming, but something special happened in 1869. The Suez Canal opened. And that cut the travel from the Philippines to Europe to only one month, especially when in addition 
to the Suez Canal, we now had the um, we now had the steamships. So you can see that now the influence of European food, not only Spanish food, but European food can now come into the Philippines, which is why uh, Filipinos also could go to Europe, they could eat Spanish food, they could eat peninsular tasting, okay, remember this, peninsular tasting Spanish food, and that is what they could now try to replicate. Not Mexican style cooking, peninsular cooking. Let's also remember if in 1869, we had the Suez Canal and now we have the steamships coming, something else happened, very important, and Rizal attended it. In 1889, France celebrated its centennial of the storming of the Bastille, in other words, 100 years of the French Republic. And that was when the Eiffel Tower was inaugurated. So the French were the ones who built the Suez Canal of 1869. And then the French inaugurate this fantastic Eiffel Tower, which is a landmark, tangible cultural property that surprises the world. So suddenly, French culture becomes the flavor of the civilized world. And people are, are eating French food. French food becomes accepted in Spain and you see Spanish versions of French food, okay? And what is happening here is the Filipinos who have already earned quite a lot of money, some of the Filipinos have earned quite a lot of money from all the agricultural export, the domestic trade of, of, of agriculture that they have earned from uh, providing the Spanish government with uh, the contracts to feed the Spanish government. What happens is they go to university. They go to, they have the public, the secondary school of Ateneo and Tran and then they go to the University of Santo Tomas. And then they go abroad, like Rizal. So yeah, we now have a uh, middle class that has money and their spirit is opening up to a Europe and for that matter to a Spain that is liberal compared to the Spain in the Philippines. And they say, why is it that in Spain, they, they're very secular already. And then in the Philippines, we have the friars in control of so many things and they are abusing their understanding of Christianity. Where is their kindness? Where, why is it that they're not following the tenets of their religion when they treat us? So again, we find the mind expanding, not just the taste buds, but the mind. And so here we have the concept of all this new liberty, equality, fraternity, this uh, new, new careers, and Filipinos saying, why must we always be only the vice? Why can't we be the president? We cannot have an archbishop who's Filipino. The archbishop must be it must be Spanish. We can't have the head of the Navy being Filipino, no matter how bright he is, even if he studied uh, engineering in Europe. Why are we always the second class? Okay. These ideas start, start uh, materializing. And so when we have all of this filtering together with the abuses that occurred with the folk, we now have the revolution brewing. And we will skip that whole, the whole revolutionary era. Just remember that during wartime, they ran out of food. Food again became a, a problem, okay? As it does every time there is an emergency like war, okay? But when they got to the 
period of the proclamation of independence in 1898, they had now moved into a different, a different awareness. They said, we have got to be, we have got to sell the idea that we are a civilized republic, especially when the Treaty of Paris occurred. The Treaty of Paris was being negotiated. And here were the Filipinos saying, look, we, we don't want to be transferred to the Americans. We have our own republic. We have our own um, sense of being able to elect people. We have a Congress. So it is with that in mind, trying to sell who is the Filipino to an international on an international playing field, that we have this Malolos lunch and Malolos dinner prepared. The cooking is what we can call alta culinaria, to use a term of Jean Gonzalez. It is the highest possible cooking that the Filipino could do for the delegates from overseas, the guests that they had invited and they got as the chef um, they got as the chef Emilio Gonzalez who had been cooking for the Arnedo family of Sulipan. While he was there supervising the kitchens of the Arnedo family, he enter they entertained people like a Cambodian prince. They entertained people like a Russian duke. So in other words, here was this chef who could combine the best of the French cooking with the Filipino cooking. Those were his, those were his menus. And they got another person to help supervise the uh, lunch and the dinner at Manolos. And this was Juan Padilla. Like Gonzalez, he was Kapampanga. And Juan Padilla specialized in pastries and sweet making again, for the Arnedo family of Sulipan. So, so these two guys, you know, these two guys, the chef and the pastry maker, they decided, all right, we are going to prepare the, the banquet to show that we can compete with the best. No one will be able to fault our food. We are going to show off. So what did they do? They came up with a menu. It is written in French. It follows a French service. While they had what we might call the classical French cooking, they added into that menu chicken giblets cooked in the Tagalog manner during the lunch. They also added turkey with truffles cooked in the Manila style. So they didn't leave out Filipino cooking in that menu, okay? In the evening, they also added croquettes in the Philippine style. And then they added chicken sausage of the Republic, whatever that was, nobody knows. But the point is that once again, we have Filipino cooking being a combination of what we liked from overseas and what we ourselves invented. All of this comes together. And the fact that we can do it exceptionally well, that was the goal of the Malolos menu. Exceptionally well to show off the Filipino capability. We were civilized. Why aren't you going to accept us as equal to the rest of the republics? No, no ma'am, we can we can say that uh, no, no, that was also a statement of self-determination uh, of the Filipinos. Exactly. They have arrived. Exactly. Yes. Definitely. 
See, because mm -hmm. the idea is we want to show that we are like them. Now, yes, yes. it's true that we enjoyed our sinigang, we enjoyed our, our kinilaw, but we couldn't serve kinilaw there. You know what I mean? Also, you cannot serve kinilaw for that many people. But I mean, they, they chose the menu. They chose that yes. menu deliberately. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they made sure words like Philippine, Manila, Republic were incorporated into the menu, into the dishes of the menu, shows that this is a country statement. This is a yes. Philippine Republic statement. It's a form of resistance, so to speak, parang ganon, no? In a way. That they have uh, already uh, uh, extri uh, parang extracted themselves from the influences of the Spaniards. Well, I wouldn't say that we have extracted ourselves from the, from the Spanish. I think we need to look at, we have, we have grown with the Spanish, we have matured with the Spanish, and we have now grown up a little more to the point that we have maybe left that period and are now moving into another phase mm -hmm. of yes. maturation. So it's yeah. not getting rid of what maybe some of the Filipino leadership thought was good. You don't want to mm -hmm. give away the good. Mm -hmm. You want to get mm -hmm. rid of the bad. You want to get rid yes. of the bad, you see? Which yes. is why even the, the Philippine National Anthem, it has it has melody of the, the French, um, national march and it also has some melody from the spanish national march yes, yes. and then everything else about it is filipino so it's like okay thank mm -hmm. you we learned from you we've taken the good yes. we're trying to get rid of the bad and now we are moving and becoming a republic we don't want to be a colony anymore we don't want to be under anybody we want to be the president we want to be the head of the navy we mm -hmm. want to be the archbishop we want to be the president of the school. So you can see that already. The yes. sense of yes. self-determination is there. Yes. Even the choice of food for the menu. Yes, very well said, ma'am. Um, at least maganda yung clarification ninyo. No? So nag-agree naman po tayo doon na may marami pong takeaways dito. Eh, na marami tayong nakuhang magagandang uh, influences sa mga Spaniards, no? And uh, kitang-kita po yan, lutang na lutang sa, sa food waste natin, no? At uh, na, naku, nagutom po kami, no? <laughs> Napakadami po natin na pag-usapan at uh, uh, kanina na-feel na ko na yung gutom, ha? Naku, maraming salamat po, ma'am. At, uh, at uh, napaka-interesante itong uh, session na ito. Uh, nakikita namin talaga yung passion ninyo no sa food history Mantelis bago tayo magsara pwede ho bang ma makahingi lang isang statement po sa inyo na na short hmm? well we can say that the pre-colonial period Filipinos were feeding their physicality to survive during the Spanish period Filipinos were still doing that and they now had incorporated a sense of Catholicism into the way they were eating. But most importantly, they realized that food could give them an image. And in the end, at the end of the Spanish period, food was being used to give the Philippine Republic an identity. And maraming pong salamat, Ma'am Feliz. Uh, sa pagbibigay ng panahon upang ibahagi ang inyong kaalaman at karanasan. Um, gusto mong magpasalamat kay Dr. Blanca, kay Professor Aaron, uh, muli sa pagsama sa napaka-interesanting talakayan natin. Sir Aaron? Ayun, maraming salamat po sa ating lahat at uh, wag, niyong, wag po ninyong kakalimutan na ang tabayanan ang huling episode naman para sa segment na ito. No? So abangan ang susunod na episodes ng Food Trip Kainsaysayan kung saan ating ipagpapatuloy ang talakayan tukol sa ating uh, kasaysayan sa fu ating food waste. So paalam ulit at malusog at masustansyang araw sa ating lahat.
Paalam po.